Shalom. Welcome to our fourth in a five-part Facts Over Fear webinar series. We are so honored to have you join us, especially those of you who are returning week after week to join us in this journey. We also honor the indigenous land that we are on, wherever we may be in the United States. My name is Anila Afzali, and I am the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. I'm also on the board of the Faith Action Network. Uh, and, and while you've seen me usually decked out in my Seahawks attire, today is Sunday football day, but uh, I decided to not wear my Seahawks attire, but still say go Seahawks with our big win today. In any case, as I've also said before, I am a recovering attorney. I left my legal career in 2013 after a spiritual transformation that brought me back to my faith. And since then, I've been working on bridge building and justice advocacy, including starting this Facts Over Fear series with my dear brother and partner in good, Reverend Terry Kylo. And this Facts Over Fear series it consists of five animated videos that we created in order to address the myths and misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. And these are especially important before an election because studies show that anti-Muslim sentiments and misinformation about Islam and Muslims uh, increase during election cycles. If you missed the last three week sessions, you can find them on our Facebook page under Facts Over Fear, the, the Facebook page for Facts Over Fear, or on our website at www.factsoverfear.org or our Facts Over Fear YouTube channel. And the previous ones were specifically on the Islamophobia industry, Islam and peace, and then Islam and women's rights. This week or today, we're gonna to be looking at Sharia, one of the most misunderstood concepts of our time today. So we'll be talking about what Sharia actually is. But before getting to that, let me pass it over to my dear brother, Terry Kylo, to introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. And <clears throat> excuse me. And um, here we are. You know, I'm, I'm coming to you from my home office uh, here north of Seattle. And we're just so happy to have all of you with us today again. And I, I became uh, really interested in standing with my American Muslim sisters and brothers about five years ago or so, when I began to do some events with a Muslim friend of mine and saw like the incredible fear that pe some people had based on all this misinformation. And then of course I realized that a lot of this was because of there were intentional efforts to dehumanize our American Muslim neighbors and, and knowing a little bit of history and understanding how powerful dehumanization can be how it can lead to violence against groups of people or help to justify violence against folk. I knew I had to do something. And as Anila and I were speaking around Washington State and to some degree around the country, we realized that we needed to create a resource that people could go back and watch over and over again and kind of get a sense of how to respond to some of these questions. And uh, because we, we noticed that a lot of folk that wanted to be helpful, wanted to be good allies, um, didn't necessarily know what to say and would fall into some traps in responding to the to these kind of negative messages about American Muslims, um, often by repeating negative messaging, you know, over and over again, and uh, and trying to get too complicated really with things. And so we created these videos to kind of give you a, a sense, to, a resource to go back to and look at. Well, how would I respond to this issue that someone's asking? And and it's something that you could send them, so you don't have to you know carry all that weight yourself. So we're just, again, so happy to have you with us today to talk about what is Sharia. And let's watch the next video, which is about three minutes long, and it's our, our video on Sharia. So I'll start to share my screen here, and, uh, and here we go. Sharia is simply an Arabic term that refers to Islamic teachings. These include things like praying five times a day, fasting, giving in charity, being kind to parents, forgiving those who do you wrong, loving your neighbor, standing for truth and justice, similar to teachings of other faith traditions. Unfortunately, there are a lot of conspiracy theories on the internet by anti-Muslim hate groups about Islam and Muslims. Contrary to the misinformation campaign by the multi-million dollar Islamophobia industry, the reality is that Islam is one of the world's major religions, 
and shares many values with Judaism and Christianity. As one of the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam teaches similar stories to the Bible, including about Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Muslims further believe in all the prophets and believe prophets were sent to teach us the same essential message, to love and worship the one true God and to love and do good to God's creation. Islam further teaches similar basic values of compassion, mercy, justice, and charity, like other faith traditions. Linguistically, Sharia means a path that leads to water. The idea is that just as a thirsty animal seeks a path to water, we as human beings are spiritually thirsty, and Sharia provides a path toward fulfilling our spiritual thirst as human beings. Islamic teachings include the command to follow the laws of the land in which you live. So here in our country, it would include upholding the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of our land. In our country, one of the values we cherish as Americans is religious freedom. Those who seek to ban Sharia are in fact seeking to ban Islamic teachings, which strips American Muslims of their right to practice their faith. Singling out and seeking to prohibit a minority group from practicing their religion is un-American, unconstitutional, and immoral. Such attacks on our fundamental constitutional values jeopardize the freedom of all Americans. The best way to protect the religious freedom of all Americans is to uphold and preserve the right of each to freely practice their faith, just as the First Amendment mandates. So let's stand united as Americans against attacks on the rights and freedoms of any group, including American Muslims. So thank you all for watching that video. And, and now I'm just looking forward to hearing from Sister Anila to tell us some more about Sharia and, uh, and what, what, what it teaches about what it means to be a human being. Yes, thank you so very much, uh, dear brother Terry. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well uh, to, uh, before I go ahead and formally start. I hope you can see it on the screen there. Yep. Wonderful. Yay, I'm so happy when technology actually works. <laughs> so again, this concept of Sharia, it is so horribly misunderstood. And what happens here, this is similar to what happens with the word jihad that we talked about in a prior week, which is that there's been this negative propaganda campaign against it. And the way they do it is by taking a foreign word, a word nobody knows, like Sharia, and then ascribing certain horrible meanings to it. And then justifying some of those, that, that horribly wrong definition with the behavior of certain Muslim criminals whether they're individuals or groups even. So that's why it's so important to keep in mind the same two points that I made when I was talking about uh, jihad and its meanings, specifically that what Muslims do does not always equal what Islam teaches. That is so important. It's not the, very, it's not the same. And then second, that there is so much diversity in the Muslim population. There are almost 50 different Muslim-majority countries and about 80 countries where Muslims make up a sizable minority of 10% or more. So we can't talk about Muslims or Muslim states as a monolith. And in fact, there are 1.8 billion uh, Muslims in the world. So a lot of diversity, even within that uh, uh, large population. Now, what is Sharia? So Sharia, again, is Islamic teachings. That's basically what it is. And as the video shows, it's literally a path that leads to water or the way to water, the way to fulfilling ourselves spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. Uh, Dr. Sabil Ahmed talks about Sharia in a very uh, great way, which is a how-to manual that God gives as guidance for humanity. And Sharia was given to prior prophets as well. The Torah or Ten Commandments, for instance, given to uh, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. The Psalms to David, peace be upon him. The Injil or Gospel to Jesus, peace be upon him. 
And Muslims, in fact, are even commanded to believe in all of these other prophets, all of these other books that were revealed, these other revelations. And all of those revelations are example of teachings from God given to other prophets. And here, in fact, we are taught as Muslims to make no distinction between the various prophets that were uh, sort of messengers throughout the, the course of time. But there is no sort of single book or books of Sharia or one interpretation that you can point to, whether we're talking throughout history or today. There has been and continues to be enormous diversity. Now, there are, four, there are certain sources of Sharia, which include the Quran, the hadiths or sayings and teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and then also two, uh, two other things, analogy and consensus of the scholars. Those are sort of sources of Sharia, but there is no single book that you can point to, no, in the, you know, sort of no book on Sharia, uh, because it is more of an abstract concept. It refers to how Muslims conduct all aspects of their lives in accordance with what God teaches us, sort of God's teachings and guidance. And these include teachings about justice and mercy and compassion uh, and doing good. The human effort to try to interpret divine teachings and draw actual rules, applicable rules for us, that is actually called fiqh. And let's see if I can get this. So fiqh. There are, are, in fact, books of fiqh, uh, just to be clear. Uh, the books of fiqh, those are sort of fallible. They're human creations, but they are also diverse, and they also vary with context and over time. And one of the important points to remember is that the books of fiqh, the teachings of fiqh, they do not apply to non-Muslims. And if you look at this, there's, you know, very little that actually deals with crime and punishment, which is often the, the concept that is attributed most to Sharia, even though that is not the case at all. And this actually comes from the Yaqeen Institute, these, uh, this picture and this one here. So Sharia, the main objectives of it are in fact to preserve human life, religious freedom or the practice of faith, our intellect, property and family. And, and following Sharia is intended to bring about peace and justice, harmony and order. That's supposed to be the end goals. As one famous uh, Muslim theologian described, the Sharia is entirely justice, compassion, wisdom, and prosperity. Therefore, any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with cruelty, prosperity with harm, or wisdom with nonsense is a ruling that does not belong to the, to the Sharia even if it is claimed to be so according to some interpretations. And that's so important to keep in mind. That this, this concept of sort of God's teachings to humanity. And it is supposed to be about mercy, compassion, loving your neighbor, all of those kinds of things that we're all familiar with in other faith traditions as well. And some of the specific examples of Sharia, in fact, include, as you heard in the video, um, Things like the being kind to neighbors, honoring parents, uh, giving in charity and helping those in need, feeding the hungry, even upholding the law of the land in which we live. All of those are parts of Sharia. They are all connected there. I'm sorry. And, and bringing benefit to society as well. And also due process under the law. You cannot even have a system of any kind of legal system without due process of law. And in fact, as, as the video mentions, uh, Sharia itself, sort of Islamic teachings itself, command Muslims to follow and uphold the law of the land in which they live. That is a religious duty even. And the other parts of Sharia have really to do with sort of personal acts of devotion, things like praying five times a day, giving in charity, fasting during the month of Ramadan. There are dietary restrictions or laws, things like not drinking alcohol or eating pork. There are financial guidelines like not consuming interest or not gambling. There are other personal morality kinds of codes like trying to be a better person. There are teachings to feed the poor, help those in need. Uh, all of those are parts of Sharia. And then there are also business contracts, family law, divorce proceedings, child custody, child support, all of those kinds of things that are also part of sort of Islamic teachings for Muslims in our country and beyond. Dr. Sabil uh, uh, Ahmed also gives a great analogy that imagine if an alien came from Mars and asked us, what is the U.S. Constitution? And if I responded by saying the U.S. Constitution kills people by capital punishment, you know, lethal injection, hanging or electrocution. 
would that be a fair assessment? Would that be doing justice to the U.S. Constitution to describe it and confine it and limit it to something that is so such a not even uh, part of the Constitution that we think about in terms of our daily practice, our daily life in America? Of course not. You know, this, this, I would be just mentioning not even 0.5% of the breadth and beauty of what the Constitution is actually about. And it's the same thing with Sharia. The punishment or penal system that exists in Sharia is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. There are over 6,000 verses of the Quran and less than 15 of them, you know, less than one page actually talks about any kind of punishments or, or any kind of punishment system. And even for those punishments to apply, there are extremely strict conditions that must be met. And jurists or rulers are supposed to follow due process of law. And even then, they are supposed to bend over backwards, you know, in as many ways, even in bizarre ways that you can think of, in order to avoid any kind of actual punishment. They're supposed to look for any excuse to not apply the punishment. This is because mercy is such an important component of the law of Sharia as well. And you have to keep in mind that every legal system has a punishment system because there has to be a checks and balances. It doesn't matter that you always, it doesn't mean that you always have to use those checks and balances, but they exist there for a certain purpose. But it is important to keep in mind that nobody is allowed to take the law into their own hand. You know, vigilante justice is absolutely prohibited. You need an actual due process of law and you need certain other conditions that simply do not exist for the application of even those tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of punishments uh, that might exist uh, in Islamic law. And even then, you know, again, the, the mercy component is far, far greater. The majority of Sharia actually talks about things like the ones we've mentioned, you know, respecting neighbors, being good to them, being good to parents, being good to our fellow Americans, uh, treating uh, others well the way we want to be treated, uh, doing what we can to benefit society. And I have to say that those who fear Sharia coming to the U.S., which is a, a fear, an actual part of a conspiracy theory that is promoted, those people, you, know, you just have to realize that Sharia has been part of our country since the very beginning, both because Muslims and Islam have been part of our country since before we even were founded as an independent nation, you know, first uh, uh, even brought over as part of the slave trade here. But beyond that, we have, we have Sharia in the sense of the U.S. Constitution talking about justice and equality. When you talk about innocent until proven guilty, that is part of Sharia as well. The idea of all of us being equal before the law, that is part of Sharia as well. You know, it is very much against the sort of injustices or forms of oppression against anybody. But, but like we can do with, with other concepts, you know, we gave this example before, some people have abused, for instance, the Bible by taking things out of context and, you know, the Crusades, Spanish Inquisition, genocide of our indigenous siblings. A lot of those were done in the name of the Bible or in the name of God or the name of religion, but they were not a reflection of religion or the Bible or, you know, what Jesus taught, peace be upon him. We do not and should not blame the religion when individuals abuse religious scripture uh, in order to promote their own good their, their, or their own you know, political pursuits or power. It's the same way in Islam or with Muslims as well. If some people, people who are ignorant even and call themselves Muslim, if they do certain things in the name of Sharia, in the name of Jihad, in the name of the Quran, in the name of Islam, if they go against the religion, the, the actual teachings of the religion, we, we should blame those individuals or those individual groups and not the religion itself on the whole. And when a Muslim says, like myself, when I say I follow Sharia or I believe in Sharia, it just means that I believe that these are a set of rules for my own life, that I want to live my own life by. It does not mean that I want this for the law of the land necessarily. It does not mean that I want to impose this on others. That would actually go against what Sharia itself teaches. So that's important to keep in mind. Unfortunately, you know, there has been a whole effort, this conspiracy theory that has been driven in our country to try to promote a uh, sort of anti-Sharia movement. This is a popular movement that, especially uh, in the last sort of, you know, 
10, 10 years, we've seen an increase in anti-Sharia legislation. We've seen this kind of demonization of Islam and Muslims and this uh, efforts even by anti-Muslim groups, anti-Muslim hate groups to promote rallies and efforts to combat Islam and Muslims. And that's what they are. They are attacks on Islam and Muslims. This is, I know I shared this picture before. This was from uh, one of the several ones across our country of uh, sort of anti-Sharia uh, hate rallies that were promoted by one of the largest anti-Muslim hate groups in our country, Act for America. And people who showed up there, they were marching, they were protesting against Sharia. Now, when somebody says they're protesting against Sharia or Islamic teachings, what they are protesting is my right as a Muslim to be able to practice my faith in our country, in our country that is built on religious freedom. It actually goes against the very core and essence of our country's values to say you stand against sort of uh, uh, me as a Muslim being able to practice my faith. And yet that's what it was. It was these hate rallies and people who came up like this couple, they were being, they, they were clearly fed sort of this propaganda, this uh, conspiracy theories that they were sort of questioning, you know, the ability of Sharia to coexist with the U.S. Constitution, for instance, even though, as I said, Sharia itself mandates that we uphold the law of the land in which we live. And these kinds of sort of uh, misinterpretations, fabrications, or decontextualizations is what has happened with creating this imagery uh, that is very ugly about Sharia. And there's a purpose for that, that the anti-Muslim groups have uh, promoted this for a specific reason of fear-mongering and sort of promoting these dangerous stereotypes for political or personal or financial gain. In fact, since 2010, Lawmakers in over 40 states have introduced bills, again, sort of aiming to block Sharia. Some of these list Sharia by name. Others refer more broadly to religious or cultural laws. Uh, but either way, these kinds of bills have, in fact, even been passed in 14 states. This is according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I have to say that these kinds of bills, they are entirely unnecessary. You know, they include this clause that they prohibit foreign law in American courts, uh, but this is something that is useless because the U.S. Constitution already expressly denies authority to any foreign law that conflicts with it because the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of our land. So our Constitution already protects us from this. And in fact, in response to this anti-Sharia movement that we were seeing sort of in 2010 and 2011 in particular, the American Bar Association even formally published a letter opposing such bills and, and identifying them as unnecessary and raising concerns with what these are really in, in fact intended to do. And that's when we get to the second point, which is these kinds of bills are in fact dangerous. They are a threat to religious freedom everywhere. And they in fact discriminate specifically against Muslims in this instance. And they're used as a fear-mongering tactic to demonize Islam and Muslims and promote Islamophobia. This campaign was created in order to promote fear by these anti-Muslim activists and groups. And this point was even admitted by one of the main architects of the anti-Sharia movement, David uh, Yerushalmi. He admitted that he actually wanted friction. He didn't, like if these bills were just passed without anybody talking about them or promoting the kind of fear that he wanted to see, that they would not achieve their purpose then. They would not serve their purpose if they passed in every state without any friction. What he wanted is people to start talking about this, to spreading fear, spreading paranoia, and spreading sort of the kind of hatred against Islam and Muslims. That's what he even admitted. In fact, those who seek to restrict the freedom of Muslims to practice their faith are the ones who are sort of violating our constitutional values, our constitutional principles. Again, by somebody trying to take away my right as a Muslim to practice my faith in a country founded on religious freedom, that effort is actually unconstitutional. And by doing this, we're limiting my ability to use my religion in, in a way that could even benefit me. This goes to another point that a lot of people don't often talk about, which is that the Sharia, um, aspects of Sharia that might come up in the context of law in any way here in our country would be in areas of sort of uh, marriage, the marriage contract, or um, sort of alimony, child custody, spousal support, things like that. Those are places where a couple, a Muslim couple, might want Islamic teachings to apply to their marital contract. 
And by stripping that away from me as, as a Muslim woman, for instance, you know, in Islam, we talked last week about how my property is entirely my own. It doesn't matter if that property came to me before marriage, during marriage, or after marriage, it is entirely my own, whereas my husband's property is our property. It is communally owned. In our, in our state, Washington, for instance, and in many other states, there's community property laws that say that we have to share any property that is acquired during the marriage. Well, if we both agree that we want Islamic law to apply or Islamic teachings to apply, then that community property aspect of Washington's or the ground rules for Washington law would not necessarily be the same as what we as parties want to contractually agree to and what would support me as a Muslim woman much stronger than sort of something else. But we're stripping people away from the ability to choose what they want to apply to their contracts. And in fact, anti-Sharia legislation is, is a danger to all of us because it is directly connected to other forms of restrictive uh, legislation. I want to play this video real quick. Hope it works. What do people who identify as one or more of the following have in common? They are all targets of restrictive legislation, often by the very same lawmakers. ISPU gathered hard data from over 3,100 bills filed across all 50 U.S. states and found that between 2011 and 2017, lawmakers have proposed restrictive bills that limit access to the polls, immigration and asylum seeking, women's reproductive rights, the rights of LGBTQ people, labor unions, and Muslim religious freedom. Among those proposed laws were 177 anti-Sharia bills introduced in 37 state legislatures. But what do anti-Sharia bills have to do with other kinds of restrictive legislation? Let's look at one of these states. In North Carolina, legislators passed the Family, Faith, and Freedom Protection Act, or HB 695. HB 695 was promoted as an anti-Sharia bill to prevent implementation of Islamic law in a state where Muslims make up less than 1% of the population. But at the last minute, state legislators slid in a measure that would restrict abortion rights. This isn't an isolated incident. 85% of lawmakers who sponsored anti-Sharia measures also supported a restrictive law in another issue area. So who is proposing this legislation? Our research shows that states dominated by Republicans have the most restrictive state house agendas. However, only a minority of Republican lawmakers, just 3%, are involved in supporting anti-Sharia legislation. And 13% are involved in supporting any type of restrictive legislation. So what should you do? Educate yourself increase self-awareness and education on multiple issue areas. Get intersectional. Recognize potential organizations and communities that have experienced similar strategies of targeted legislation and build coalitions. Talk back. Engage lawmakers, especially those who support restrictive legislation. Why should you care about anti-immigration, anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ, right to work, anti-Sharia, and anti-refugee laws? Because it affects your neighbor, friend, spouse, coworker, you. To learn more about our research and to use our interactive map, visit ispu.org slash Islamophobia. So that video from ISP really shows the interconnectedness of these various forms of restrictive legislation, which is in fact promoted by a tiny minority, but it is used specifically with Islam and Muslims as a way to promote a conspiracy theory. Uh, and, and again, Sharia, especially in the places where it might come up in the legal context, it really is about having a, 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 a having Islamic teachings be considered. It does not mean that they will in fact be applied. There's still, just like with any other law, whether we're talking about Jewish law, whether we're talking about other law, there is still uh, a judge that has to assess that and determine whether or not it is in, you know, consistent with the U.S. Constitution and public policy as well before even applying any kind of teachings from any other source. But just like Jews, for instance, are in, uh, allowed to have their religious teachings used in, in interpreting 
certain things like what did the parties want? What were they trying to achieve with this contractual provision? That's the very same way that Muslims simply want the very same treatment there. And as I mentioned, there are in fact, oops, sorry. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, sort of some of the pro-women aspects of Islamic teachings that are undermined if you do not allow people to have their religious teachings taken into account. Uh, so there's a couple sources there that you can go to if you want that. But finally, though, the point I want to make is that this conspiracy theory related to Sharia is, in fact, used as a way to attack American Muslims and used as almost a loyalty test for American Muslims. There's in fact uh, groups and individuals who go around uh, identifying American Muslim elected leaders and send them a questionnaire even of all kinds of just horribly anti-Muslim <laughs> messaging, let's say, and ask them a bunch of questions. And they include, do you support Sharia? And if somebody responds, yes, because I as a Muslim support my Islamic teachings, if I say yes, that I'm seen as not supporting the constitution, or if I ignore that, then they are identified in a list of people who refuse to uphold the, the US constitution. This is actually a website that exists, unfortunately. But this is all an effort to try to portray Muslims, as, American Muslims, as sort of somehow less loyal Americans, when in fact the very opposite is true. The majority of Muslims in our country are US citizens, 86%, that number might even be higher now. Uh, and also, they're stronger, sort of the stronger that a Muslim's religious identity is, the stronger of an American identity they have as well, according to data. So this challenges this idea that our Muslim identity and our American identity are at odds. In fact, they are directly aligned, as I've said before. And also, uh, mosque attendants, the people who go to mosque more often, are more engaged civically in society. And this includes things like working with others in the community to try to fix problems uh, and improve conditions in our country. Religion is, in fact, very important to uh, Muslims, just like evangelicals and, and others. This is a, a poll here from uh, ISPU that talks about how important religion is to their daily lives. So for Muslims, it is very important, but Muslims do not seek, seek to in any way impose their religion on others. This chart shows how Muslims actually are very high on private engagement with their religion, but much lower on sort of the public engagement compared to other groups. And in fact, the groups that have tried to and want to seek, want to sort of establish religious law in our country are often not Muslims. You know, Muslims do not generally want that. There's this chart that shows uh, that white evangelicals are most likely to say that religion should be a source of American law. And you can see the dark blue is people, uh, the percentage that think it should be a main source of law. The, you know, in between blue is some source of law. And then the light blue is not a source of law. And even on these polls, you have to keep in mind, whether it's Muslims, Christians, or others, that when you ask about sort of, do you want your religious teachings to be part of law? It could be things like, yes, I want the value of justice. Yes, I want the value of mercy and compassion to be part of sort of my state religion, for instance, or my country's religion. So it is important to keep that in mind. But it is also important to keep in mind that this effort to try to demonize Islam and Muslims by somehow identifying Muslims as the ones who are seeking to impose their religious sort of teachings on others fundamentally goes against reality. It goes against sort of uh, everything that we know about and about Muslims and Islam. And in fact, if we actually understood that, if we want to sort of protect religious freedom for all, we really have to stand against efforts to attack or demonize any religious community, especially marginalized or minority religious communities in our country, and work instead to uphold our constitutional principles, including the religious freedom, which is such an important principle in our, uh, in our country. We need to uphold that as a way to protect all of us, regardless of our, back, our faith background or no faith background, in order to preserve our constitutional principles, in order to preserve our American identity as well. So that's what I hope we do together. Uh, and I invite you in that journey with us to really uphold our American values, including of religious freedom, and stand against any of these efforts by anti-Muslim hate groups to really demonize or attack Muslims. And I will stop there and pass it over to my brother, Terry. Well, part of what, and thank you so much, Anila. And every time I, I listen to you on this, I learn so much more. And some of those scholars, I just really appreciated what they had to say, and I want to read and, and learn more from them. You know, the reality is, friends, that when there's an attack on the religious liberty of one group, it doesn't just, uh, isn't just an attack on them, because rights aren't rights unless they're for everyone. 
And if a right can be diminished toward one group, it can be diminished toward you later in a different context. And so we really have to be standing up with each other and for each other and for our US constitutional values and for justice and mercy and the rule of law, right? Uh, and stand against those kinds of policies and laws that really are, are demeaning, right? The, the, uh, the religious liberty that our US constitution enshrines. So now I'm gonna share a few, a few uh, slides here and talk with you a little bit about some of the, the, the similarities between Sharia and between uh, Christian teaching and in the larger Abrahamic tradition as well. And you may notice pretty soon that we have another panelist coming to join us. So that's Rabbi Al Alana Suskin and I'll introduce her after I'm through. So the first thing we just want to help you help you recognize that within the larger Abrahamic tradition, there really are, are two primary teachings. And then I think a third one is emerging in importance today with the uh, larger environmental crisis. The first one is to love God more than your tribe and tradition. And this is a phrase, a phraseology that I came up with uh, after doing, you know, hundreds of conversations in churches and mosques and synagogues. Um, about this because so often people assume that when we say we love God, it's like we love our, our God, the God that we somehow own, which of course is not an Abrahamic tradition kind of notion. So, so the, the core of the Abrahamic tradition is to love God more than your tribe and tradition, and even more than your own idea of God. Like God's beyond all that, and yet we also recognize that those teachings are important for us to understand God as God's been revealed to us in our specific traditions. Number two, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves and to understand that, that love, which in this case doesn't mean the emotion of love, it means seeking the well-being of your neighbor and activity and risking yourself in doing so, um, that, that sometimes you know, my good and the good of my neighbor come into conflict and we have to find a way to make that work. And sometimes that's very difficult and demanding. And then I think a third teaching, which is more and more important today is managing our economy, economy equitably within the limits of the ecosystem. And so these, these two teachings, and then this third one really form the basis for the Sharia or the teaching of Judaism Christianity and Islam. And we have to understand that that basis, uh, it really underlies all of them. And so we know that Christianity um, emerged as part of a Jewish movement. And what was the core of the, the Jewish understanding of God was that, was that the people of Israel had been enslaved in Egypt, had been ca uh, held captive in Babylon, and this is a beautiful picture by a friend of mine named Dan Erlander describing what the culture was like there, that there's a God figure who blesses the king, blesses the system the way it is. The priesthood says yes, the military says this is the way it's going to be. And a lot of people are kind of enslaved by this system and really hurt by it. This is essentially an unjust system. And the story is that God decided that God wasn't going to bless the system, that God was going to bless the slaves at the bottom so that then something new could emerge. And of course, at the time of Jesus, there was a third kind of, of injustice taking place where Augustus Caesar, who claimed to, to be God, the son of a God, um, had really imposed uh, the Roman will and the Roman culture on the people of Israel and were actively stealing from them. It was like being ruled by the mob with a standing army. And so Jesus in this context, uh, you know, saw, heard, heard the deep story of freedom from slavery and, and coming home from captivity in Babylon and said, there's, there's got to be a way to, to, to address this, even though the Romans have a huge army and would probably be unbeatable. And so Jesus began to teach, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. And so Jesus was proposing, right, that a big change needed to happen. And what, how I understand this term kingdom of God is, that is God's way of mutuality, um, is, a, is a term I like to use for that. And it is God's love and grace and shalom in everyday life, in every aspect of human relationship, public, private, economic, political, personal, communal, body, mind, and environment. So Jesus is, is envisioning an ethic 
being a faithful Jewish person that would help inform a society that would be structured differently. And one way to describe it would be this, a society where everybody's on the same level. And of course, Christians would place the cross in the center of that, not the cross as a religious symbol, but the cross is our willingness to, to work and even risk to help this happen. And so um, Jesus, in talking about uh, the, the law and the prophets, he is totally open to Jewish teaching. He says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And so Jesus isn't, isn't trying to say that the law is bad. Jesus is trying to work to build a community that fulfills that law in a way that the Romans were not really allowing to happen. But he does have a critique, right, of some, of some uh, Jewish leaders. He does not have a critique of Judaism. He's a Jewish person. He's a faithful Jewish person. But he has a critique of Judaism in the way that, or excuse me, uh, he has a critique of Jewish leaders um, who, under the pressure of the Roman Empire, were using some of the laws and rules to, to, uh, to kind of make people um, so busy that they, that they couldn't live out justice. And so Jesus says, for you tithe dill, dill, mint, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. And maybe you heard some of that justice and mercy and faith in what Anila said earlier. So again, a very similar kind of thing. Uh, uh, Christianity having a, a, a kind of an ethic, a set of rules, but not being a set of rules, but rather um, uh, attempting to, to breathe in those those ways to live out love of God and love of neighbor in such a way that it's written on our hearts. And so in the, in the book of John, you know, Thomas asked Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we find the way? And Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so for Christians, this word, the way, I mean, if it was translated into Arabic, it would be the word Sharia. So that for Christians, Jesus embodies the, the law as it would be lived out in the first century and therefore helps us to begin to live out that law uh, um, as it's as written in our hearts. And so, um, but the, one of the differences between uh, Christianity and Judaism and Christianity and Islam, there's kind of like two major differences. One I brought up a few weeks ago. One is that, um, that Jesus never had to function as a ruler of an area, right? So he just didn't have to make those kind of calls. He was, he was a revolutionary leader trying to help, you know, really encourage people to live out the law of love in their everyday life under incredibly difficult circumstances of the Roman Empire's uh, domination of them. Um, but he, he does, the second difference is, is pretty critical, is that Jesus set aside in this passage here, listen to me, all of you, and understand that there's nothing outside a person that in, by going in can defile but the things that come out are what defile. And so um, Christians have a large body of teachings about how to love our neighbor, but we did set aside, according to the teachings of Jesus, um, purity codes. And as such, sometimes Christians like misunderstand both, both uh, our Jewish neighbors and our Muslim neighbors who still have purity codes as a, a part of their, of their life. And we can get kind of judgmental about that as if that's bad or wrong. Uh, but Jesus isn't saying it's bad or wrong. He's just setting it aside for Christians uh, because I think he felt that it was a better way for the Christian community to move in such a way that they could include more Gentiles or more people who were not Hebrew or Jewish into their community. And so uh, Christianity and Islam share a tremendous amount of teachings, but all of them are based on, on those two teachings, love of God more than tribe and tradition, love of neighbors, we love ourselves. There's a great respect for governance, right, within both. But there's also a questioning of how people who govern sometimes operate in ways that aren't full of mercy and justice for everyone. Which is why, of course, for, for all three traditions, the U.S. Constitution is so great because it tries to embody in a way that's practical and that we can have built on for these last 240 years um, a justice and liberty for all even though we've fallen far short of that. So what I'm gonna do is stop sharing the screen right now and see if Alana is on. And Alana is here, I'm so happy. So let me introduce Alana for a moment. Um, she's an educator, an activist, and a writer. She is the editor of the progressive blog, jewschool.com. 
She served as an assistant rabbi at Adas Israel in Washington, D.C. She reaches across faith traditions to fight Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And together with uh, Hamza Khan, she has founded the Pomegranate Initiative to counteract Islamophobia and anti-Semitism out east. And so, Alana, we're so happy to have you with us. Great to be here. I'm fresh from my holiday. I literally just got online after the holiday, uh, the first few days of the uh, Sukkot holiday um, just finished. And so now we have a couple of like sort of intermediate days before we go back into the end of the holiday season. Well, I, I certainly hope that that, that that was really meaningful for you and, and in this time of great busyness and so much news out there. So I'm glad you, you were able to take some time and center, be, be centered within, within the beauty of your tradition. Thank you. It's, um, it's actually the perfect holiday to talk about this, this uh, topic. Um, you know, I, was, I got the, sort of the last two minutes of it, so I, I apologize for not having a PowerPoint to share. Um, oh, for don't worry. Late. <laughs> don't but, worry at all. So, so, so Alana, you're, you're familiar with Sharia in Islam, and how would you elaborate for us on, on Jewish law or halakha, and is it similar to Sharia? Um, what are some of the similarities and differences? So it's funny, I came on just as you were talking about how if you translated the way into Arabic, it would be Sharia. Similarly, if you translated it into Hebrew, it would be Halakha, which is the exact, right? That's our, that is how we refer to our code of Jewish law and the way we live. Um, so in that sense, I think all three traditions really hold a similar view about you know, how we find our path, right, our way. Um, through justice and you know and Islam and Judaism also share that there's um, there's a, a sacred set of laws which are um, also include ritual behaviors um, and I actually you know one of the things so we just so this week's holiday is Sukkot but last week's holiday was Yom Kippur we're in the middle of our big holiday season for the year the fall one we have another one in the spring which starts with Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur and then sort of so it ends in a big celebration, which is Sukkot, which um, looks at sort of it's the it's sort of the grace period at the end where we are back in love with God and we build these um, sort of very fragile little structures and we live in them for a week. And they're representative of God's grace and sort of the fragility of humanity and um, that God sort of protects us with with this with this dwelling that we're in with God and it's almost like we we're moving in with God you know we're having our little our little honeymoon um, but last week when we were reading on uh, Yom Kippur in the morning the, there's a, a prophetic reading from Isaiah 50, 57 and 58 and it, it really it's actually very much in line with what you were saying right so I'm just going to read a few of the verses since I did not for, uh, um, have a PowerPoint ready but I think it'll be very familiar to people, right? Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a shofar and show my people their transgression and the house of Yaakov their sins. Yet they seek me daily and desire to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me judgments of justice. They desire that God should be near. Why have we fasted, they say, and, no, don't, and you don't see it. Why have we afflicted our soul and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you pursue your business and you exact all your payments. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You don't fast this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is that the fast I've chosen? A day for someone to afflict their soul? Is it to bow down your head like a bulrush and spread sackcloth and ashes under them? Are you calling this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this rather the fast that I have chosen to loose the chains of wickedness to undo the bands of the yoke and to let the oppressed bro go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share thy bread with the hungry and that you bring the poor that are cast out to thy house where you see the naked, you cover him and you don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth like the morning. Right, that's, that's part of what we read on the morning of Yom Kippur. And it's very clear that it's, right? Yes, of course I desire these ritual behaviors of you, but they have a purpose. They're not like for funsies. They're in order to teach you a particular way of being in the world that when you engage in these ritual behaviors, they are, the law teaches you how to be in the world and also how to be with God. And part of that, that is, that is inextricable 
from justice, right? There's no ritual behavior that doesn't also teach justice. When you talk about what goes into your mouth because we keep kosher, right? It's to remind you about, all, there's all kinds of different things that it reminds you about, but like it reminds you of people who are hungry. It reminds you that, you know, you have to think about the food you're eating because there's people who grow it and they bring it to you and you have to care for them. There's people who are hungry that don't have food, right? There's all of these pieces that come as part of that ritual behavior. And that's why in the Jewish community, and I believe also in the Muslim community, those ritual behaviors are so inextricable from our, what, what you might think of as sort of, um, you know, uh, universal laws, right? Laws that are ethical. There's no clear distinction between those two. And they're to teach us in our own communities about how to be in the world and also about how to bring the divine into the world and how those two things are inextricably, inextricably connected. Yeah, I just want to add there, Rabbi, that absolutely, and that is true in Islam as well, this idea that our daily prayer, our, you know, our eating guidelines, halal, similar to kosher, uh, they are about justice. They are also about purifying ourselves and our actions. And like you said, bringing the divine into the mundane existence of life. Every day connecting ourselves to God in that kind of way. And you, know, you, you mentioned some aspects of kosher or halal. It's also justice to animals. And you see sort of the mistreatment of animals and how horrible that is with factory farming and everything else. And halal or kosher is supposed to help us avoid those kinds of abuses of you know, animals or anybody or anything because our teachings are about justice, are about mercy, are about sort of peace and, and sort of bringing harmony to the world, not destroying that harmony through abuse or exploitation. Right, and that's a wonderful thing to focus on. So the idea about kosher slaughter, right? The idea of kosher slaughter has these very like picayune laws, but what do those picayune laws talk about? They say, right, okay, so the knife that you use can't have any nicks or scratches on it because if they do, then when you, when you cut the animal's throat, it will pull and it will hurt the animal, right? The knife is actually obliged to be so sharp that the animal does not feel it. And why do you have to learn where precisely on the neck of the animal to do the, the slaughter? Oh, because that's the one spot where it's not supposed to hit a nerve ending, right? Yep. So it, you know, all of these, as you say, right, all of these things which seem kind of picayune and weird, they're, they're for an absolute specific purpose. So that's, a, that's like a perfect example. Yeah, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, specifically said that you have no right to kill an animal twice. And meaning that you have to do it right, that you have to follow certain procedures to minimize harm uh, and to sort of uh, make sure you acknowledge the, the huge uh, aspect of what you're doing. You're taking the life of an animal, and that's a huge weight that you're supposed to take seriously. So that's, that's sort of in eating, dietary guidelines. There's also things, you know, in everyday practice. Charity in Islam is a way to purify your wealth. And it is not something that is just sort of you're doing it to help others. It's actually something you personally have a responsibility in order to purify your wealth, not to help others. That there's also that benefit, but it's to purify your own wealth. That zakat is mandatory. All other forms of charity are highly encouraged, but there's one form that is specifically to purify wealth. That's interesting. I mean, I don't, we, we don't have it precisely that way, but also I know that the word for charity in um, Hebrew and Arabic is actually very similar, tzedakah or um, tzedakah, right? And I'm, I believe that it actually has the same meaning, which is justice, right? We don't actually view it as, it's not something you do out of the kindness of your heart. It's something you do because God obligates you to do it. You must take care of other people in your community. And in fact, um, in the structure of Jewish law, over time, it's come to be that the Jewish community itself has rules to be able to come to like take stock of what members of the community own and can compel them to give charity to in order to help the community and make sure that there are no poor within your borders. Yep, absolutely. So, so would you, would either of you, um, how, how do you two understand, you know, I, I, so I've heard very clearly now that, 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 um, Sharia and Halakha are, are, they're, 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 there's a lot of specificity to them, but there's a deep purpose uh, in terms of, of having an ethic about how we live, how we, as you said, Alana, live in the world with other people. Um, so are, like, like Alana, are, are you thinking that, you, that, that I should obey those laws? No, I mean, the truth, I mean, it might be good. Like there are definitely <laughs> things that people can learn from it. Sure, I Absolutely. would never discourage you, but Jewish no. law only applies to Jews. 
right? And in fact, one of the things that, that often really confuses people um, about Judaism is that when people come to convert, we actually discourage them. Um, we, we say, we say, you know, are you sure you really want to not discourage them? Like, no, 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 you can't. But like, you gotta be really sure. Cause it's a big pain in the butt to be a Jew. Like there's all of these things you have to do. And you know, there's a lot to learn and, you know, you really have to be committed to this process because as a, you know, um, we have a saying that says the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come, right? You don't have to be a Jew to get the reward. You just have to be a good person. If you want to be a Jew, though, then you take on all of these other things and you're kind of stuck. So, so no, you got to know if you really want to do it. <laughs> but if you're not a Jew, you're not obligated to do these things. Yeah, and, and the same is true with Islam and, and Sharia, that the sort of Islamic teachings, those Islamic laws do not apply to you if you are not a Muslim. They are only intended to guide and regulate the behavior of Muslims, and the Muslims have to choose to, to apply them. Like, they could be that certain rules that Muslims given the diversity of Muslims, they don't even apply in their daily lives. There are, you know, wine drinking, gambling, interest consuming, pork eating Muslims here in America and around the world, right? Uh, it has to be an individual choice. And that's one part that I think is often not given enough attention. You know, the, the Quran is very explicit. I know next week we might go into this more deeply, but the Quran is very explicit that there can be no compulsion in religion. It really has to be an individual choice. And that choice is whether or not to be a Muslim, but it's also whether or not and to what extent you apply the rules, the laws. The rules, the rules are there, the sort of teachings are there, but whether and to what extent you choose to apply them in your own life varies by individuals. We don't have a pope, you know, we don't have in, in sort of in, in Islam, there is no sort of sp uh, specifically orthodox Sunni Islam, there is no sort of hierarchical leader who's supposed to tell you what to do or not do. You're supposed to read the Quran directly, you're supposed to build a personal relationship with God, and you're supposed to follow the teachings as you understand them. And of course, going to scholars and others for guidance to understand the teachings, but ultimately it is your responsibility and your choice. Yeah, well, you know, just to, just to make something really clear, like, you know, with, within the Christian tradition, I mean, many of us do the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, right? And so we're eating bread and wine, which is a gift from God through nature. You know, so we're celebrating nature in that moment. We're celebrating the fact that we're eating a ritual meal, not only with, with the people around us in the room, although right now we can't be in the room, but with people of all time. And we're, we're sharing a meal which, which includes God's presence, which then extends beyond the Christian community to all human beings and to all animal and plant life. So, so that, that sense of ritual helping to convey something beyond the mere actions of helping to create an ethic like it's a really important part of Christianity too. It's just that Christianity sort of lost some of the purity codes back there, but but not all of them, and certainly didn't lose the moral teachings. Uh, and and I, I'm I'm finding myself to be deepened in my moral teachings um, and understanding them better uh, through Christianity through my contact with with Judaism and Islam. And that's I think something that a lot of people. Uh, don't understand properly is again sharia is islamic teachings and there was sharia given to other communities so there's christian teachings there's jewish teachings and those simultaneously exist uh, and understanding how it goes well beyond law it's about morality it's about ethics it's about justness you know justice uh, all of these aspects are really what sharia what god sort of teachings are all about and the way we sort of ensure religious freedom for all is to uphold that freedom for each individual to choose what and how they wish to practice, you know, in our country and elsewhere. So I, I, I want to get at, you know, uh, Alana and Anila, like, why do you think Jews and Judaism um, have not been demonized in the same way as Muslims and Islam, despite the similarity between, you know, Sharia and Halakha? Like, what, what do you think is going on with that? So, I mean, that's a complicated question. So um, if you look back historically, um, Jews in lots of places, particularly in Europe, there's a history of, um, of persecution, which has, it's, it's a very different kind of history. So it often centers around sort of the, the tension between the mother and daughter religion um, in which, you know, there's a, there's a striving for dominance um, and in which Jews were often considered, I mean, almost always considered outsiders until the modern era, 
really Jews couldn't be citizens in any of those countries. You had to be a Christian. Um, and actually, just for, in, for interest's sake, right, that was actually not true in Muslim countries. In Muslim countries, um, Jews, Christians, particularly in the Ottoman Empire, right, Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians actually had their own status. I'm sure Anila, you know, has plenty more to say about that, but they had their own status and it was actually, um, they were protected in a way. And it, it's interesting because sort of towards the end of the Ottoman Empire, there actually were quite a few Jews who were, who were, I guess citizens isn't quite the right word, but residents of that empire, part of that empire, who were really concerned about Europeans coming in with this, with, with this idea because they were very worried. The Ottoman Empire largely protected them and that was not true in European countries. And we actually saw the outcome of that in, in um, one really good example of this is the city of Salonika, uh, Thessaloniki now in Greece, where there were large numbers of Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And in fact, the relationships between those communities were so good that there was a lot of intermarriage between the three communities, so much so that there was a syncretic religion that had started to arise between the three. Um, but what happened was when the Greeks and the Ottoman Empire did a transfer of Muslims and Christians so that all the Christians would be sent back to Greece, which was a Christian country, right, and the Muslims went back to the Muslim nation, right, then all of a sudden you had all these strangers, right, so the Jews and who live there now, right, the Muslims who had been their neighbors all along were no longer there, the Jews were there, they weren't getting exchanged anywhere, but all of these Christians who came back didn't know who they were. And so when World War II started, there was no relationships with their neighbors and they were decimated. Um, and, you know, so this, this incredibly, very, like this city, which had this incredibly rich history, like it was just gone. Um, and that's really still true today. Well, you know, and, and I'd like to respond to my own question for a minute, Anila, and then I'll, I'll let you go, is that you know, what we're talking about here is, is Christian supremacy, mm -hmm. right? are two expressions of Christian supremacy, and um, which is a very painful topic for, for Christians today who are trying to grapple with the, the history of that and trying to unwind that and trying to pull, pull those, those, uh, those terrible threads out of the fabric, you know, that is our, it is our tradition. You know, in Matthew 28, Jesus says, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and so, and so on. But that word of uh, can just as easily be translated among. And I believe that Jesus was trying to start a movement uh, of people to live out the, the, the way of Jesus in, in the world, risking ourselves for our neighbor in order to love God and love our neighbor and, and care for the planet in which we live, that he was trying to open that to everyone. But I think what happened when the Roman Empire took Christianity over is that among became an of. And, and then often, you know, as people do, you know, we begin to think that our way of understanding God is the only way and begins to define God. And then, and then we become number one and everybody else becomes number four and number five. And, and we begin a process where, where, we, where we look at other traditions, you know, uh, in a really negative way. And I think Christianity has, has to work on that right now and try to understand how we can be faithful to Jesus and... Um, also learn from and partner with our Jewish and Muslim neighbors. And, and I would add to that, that uh, certainly Muslims around the world need to do that as well in terms of recognizing minority rights and ensuring the kind of religious freedom that is espoused by Islam uh, uh, as well as other faith traditions. And specifically, you know, to your question, uh, Brother Terry, about sort of why is there this difference between Muslims and Jews, uh, at least in our country, with respect to sort of uh, treatment, let's say. Uh, if the first one I would say specifically is that there is a concerted effort for a propaganda reason uh, that doesn't exist with, with Jews uh, and Judaism. Even if the laws might be similar, even if the concept of having a law that is about purification and justice might exist similarly in Islam and Judaism, the reality is that there's an effort to paint Muslims and Islam as the enemy and justify certain decisions, foreign policy decisions, certain decisions around sort of you know, surveillance or uh, detention or you know, criminalization or whatever else it might be. There are certain uh, goals that are sought by these groups that promote anti-Muslim hate. And those same goals may not apply the same way to Jews as they do to Muslims. So it is an effort to take a, a word and really attribute certain meaning to it for a 
political purpose. And that's what we're seeing happen around sort of uh, around our country. Um, the other point that I would point um, that I would emphasize here in with respect to this conversation specifically, is that in Islam, as Rabbi Alana mentioned, and Islamic history, you've had Muslims and Muslim rulers and, and scholars and leaders uh, not only respect you know, the different faith traditions, but also even uphold the ability of different communities to apply their own law. So Jews, for instance, were governed by Jewish law in Muslim, and you know, overwhelmingly, there might be certain exceptions, but overwhelmingly, they were sort of governed by their own law. And that was the idea that Christians were going to be governed by their law if they wanted that to apply. They could choose, you know, the, the Muslim law, the Islamic law, but they did not have to because, again, that Islamic law does not apply to you if you are not a Muslim. So I think that's also something that I would point out. But the difference is because of there's political uh, uh, and financial motive to specifically demonize Islam and Muslims. If I could just throw in one little piece too, which I think um, just to add to that, which is I, I also want to think, I think there's a historical piece here as well, which is so just as Judaism had its own sort of historical um, narrative about interactions between Jews and Christians. Similarly, there's a narrative about Muslims and Christians and that that sort of, that is still being played off of. And at the same time, right, there's also a historical fact in the United States about how we treat immigrants in general, right? We, we, like, to, we like to talk about the, this wonderful diverse country and it absolutely is. And it's been a lifesaver to, you know, many, many immigrant groups who fled oppression and other kinds of um, danger. But at the same time, it's also true that historically we have been, we have gone through waves of time and much of it is when immigrants, even when they are successful in arriving, once they do arrive in, in any kind of large numbers, there's a, a large push back against that. And I think the combination of those two things, one that you know, we actually in many ways are not good with absorbing immigrants, we we you know we see them coming and we get scared and we're like, oh no, they're gonna they're gonna outnumber us and they're gonna breed like rabbits and they're gonna they're dirty or you know whatever the the current you know problem is and that combined with this historical narrative about sort of um, Richard the Lionheart and Christendom saving the world from the Muslims in Jerusalem right that's that's sort of all still in there a little bit mm -hmm. just as some some of that stuff we see arising now in discussions about Jews in this country with, you know, the, the white supremacists, right? You see some of those like historical crazinesses coming back up. And I think those two pieces together are, are a big piece of sort of how the reception of Muslims in this country is, is looking at the moment. You know, I think, I think too, um, we, I, I, I have to, I want to acknowledge again, as a, as a Christian pastor, ordained Christian pastor, that, that, that sort of the, the first religious dehumanization you know, within the Christian community, it began toward Jews. I mean, it, so anti-Semitism is sort of the deepest taproot of this kind of religious otherization. Um, but it's by no means the, the last. And I think at the moment, you know, what I see is a lot of people who want to sell more bombs and guns and airplanes and everything else, putting a lot of money into this hate uh, toward our American Muslim neighbors right now. Um, and they just don't care. All they care about is the money. They don't care about the fear that it creates in, in human beings. They don't care about the division that it creates in our communities. They don't care about the kids who get bullied in schools. They don't care about the laws that get created that will come back later and hurt somebody else. They don't care about any of that because all they care about is their money because they think they can make money off of fear. And so what, what we know is that American Jews, right, by studies, are the highest, have the highest level of support for American Muslims of any other group. Right, because they know what that's like, right? Your community knows what that's like, Alana. And I just think uh, part of the reason I'm so passionate about this is because we don't have to live like this. Mm -hmm. I, I think you said it beautifully, uh, Brother Terry, and you're right on point with that. So thank you for that. Uh, if we can turn to questions now, since we only have about eight minutes or so, uh, if that's okay, Terry? Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, I know we wanted to do a bit on messaging uh, like we usually do, but uh, just so everybody knows, we're actually going to do a special session that we're going to make available to all of you on sort of the messaging approach. And I want to point out that the reason we do the messaging is it's one thing to learn the sort of facts and reality and information that we've been presenting every week, but it's also important to know how to use that in conversations and in communications with people that you might encounter. And whether people are coming to you in a church context, they're coming to you at a synagogue, they're 
coming to you online or at a you know, Thanksgiving meal, whatever it may, may be, we want to equip you with the tools to be able to effectively respond to that kind of uh, myth or misconception that might come before you. And that's the point of the messaging piece that we've tried to incorporate every time. In the interest of time, we're, we're, I think we're going to pass on doing that today, but we will offer a special session uh, to all of you, even after next week's session, uh, that'll specifically give guidance on how to do this and even give you some case examples that, you know, Terry and I will role play different scenarios. Uh, so you'll get a sense of what it's like and how to actually respond to different myths and misconceptions you hear. So for now, since we don't have too much time, uh, I do want to turn to the first question that we have here from Heidi. And it's specifically a question about Muslim beliefs regarding the necessity to follow laws. Uh, so the, the question here is, do faithful Muslims follow laws even when a law is unjust, essentially, when it's cruel or hateful or wrong? And how do Muslims uh, sort of uh, resolve the issues that might happen if living uh, under authoritarian regimes? And I'll point out and first say that, yes, we are uh, commanded to follow the law of the land unless it violates certain principles like religious freedom. Uh, and then on the point about oppression or wrongdoing or unjust laws, you know, I would have the same view as uh, I think people throughout our country's history have had that if there's unjust laws, that is no law to follow, that you have a duty to protest, you have a duty to speak out against it. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, specifically taught us that if you see a form of oppression or injustice, that you have a duty to do what you can to undo that wrong, uh, whether it is with, with your hands, like physically stopping somebody from hurting someone, for instance. But if you can't do that with your words, with your mouth, you know, speak, speak truth to power, speak out against the injustice, call it out, name the problem, um, you know, use your power of speech uh, to sort of undo the injustice and to try to bring about positive change. And if you can't do that, then at least hate it in your heart, at least pray, you know, for, for justice to prevail. Um, and that's sort of the guidance that I would give. So in the instance of if you're living in a country that has unjust laws, whether it's our country, whether it's other countries that have authoritarian regimes, wherever it may, wherever it may be, you have a duty to do what you can to try to undo that law and make it align with justice, mercy, compassion, you know, and, and avoid oppression and injustice as much as possible. Does that conflict with the duty to uphold the law of the land? Some people say it does. You know, there are differences of opinion on this. Some people say you're not supposed to criticize a ruler, even if they're doing wrong, because you're supposed to, you know, show uh, deference to them. Um, that's certainly not the view that I uphold and that many Muslims uphold, especially if you look at statistics of people uh, engaging in, in society to try to bring about positive benefit because there are many, many teachings in Islam that really do emphasize the importance of bringing about positive benefit to society and doing good and opposing injustice or standing up you know, firmly for justice, even if it's against yourself, even if it gets against your family. So if those are part of our commandments, then certainly speaking out against an unjust ruler uh, is similarly a, a mandate that we have. And in fact, Prophet Muhammad, as we talked about during the Islam and Peace session, specifically identified speaking truth to power, speaking against a tyrant uh, as a, a, a sort of a, a one of the bigger forms, one of the greatest forms of jihad, of struggle. Well, and, and a similar tension exists within Christianity as well. I mean, Jesus began his whole ministry with the kingdom of God has come near, which meant that the kingdom of Rome was going to be on the way out because they were basically the mafia with the standing army, right? And so Jesus is attempting to, to say, we don't have to live like that. There is also the tension that we want to obey the law of the land. We want, we want to obey the rulers and the authorities, right? And as Paul says in Romans, because order is good. Having an order for the community is good. So there's this tension. And, and then we're invited into the tension of knowing, you know, when we respond to unjust laws and, and how we do that in the most effective way. And so the same tension exists uh, in Christianity. How about, how about in Judaism, Ilana? Yeah, in fact, um, we have a principle, Dina de Malchuta Dina, the law of the land is the law, um, in which particularly applies to things like uh, him, paying taxes. And <laughs> not that I'd know anybody in this anyway, um, <laughs> particularly in, in regards to paying taxes and also in defending the country, but also right. just in general. Um, and at the same time, we have principles that are specifically about rebuke. Um, there's a very famous passage in the Talmud, which says that if you have the power to rebuke someone in your household and you don't, then you um, are obligated for their sins. If you have the power to rebuke someone in your community and you don't, then you are obligated for their sins. And if you have the power to rebuke somebody 
even the entire world. If, you, if the entire world is sinning and you have the power to rebuke and you don't do so, then you are held responsible. So we also, we actually have both of those pieces that you're obligated to follow the law of the land. Um, and at the same time, you are also obligated to fight injustice. And, and part of what powers that in all three of these traditions is this notion of the way or the, the way of life, right? That God's trying to teach us through our particular leaders, you know, and, and traditions so that we can do that in real time. So that when we see injustice happening, we have, we've already thought through some of that. Some of the stories and some of the, the teachings that we brought in have, have helped us to recognize that injustice and given us some tools and help us to recognize our own responsibility in responding to that. Yep, absolutely. Um, I have a separate question here uh, from someone about specifically this idea of uh, Christians as victims uh, or having their religious freedom stripped. That there is this narrative in our country about Christians uh, losing religious freedom. And how do you respond to that specifically when uh, Muslims have been attacked with these anti-Sharia bills or legislation? Terry, do you want to take that question? Yeah, so it's you know super complicated. So first of all, let's just let's just be clear that, that white Christian supremacy is real and, and often Christians don't really recognize it as such. Um, that, that, that Christians are superior is, is sort of the notion. And that if, if everybody else became Christian, all the problems would go away in the world, which is very silly because you can see we've got 33,000 Christian denominations in the country, for goodness sake. So, so what, what's happening is that as the country is becoming more diverse and religiously diverse, some among us uh, are kind of fearful about that. Some Christians are fearful about that. And they're, they're confusing a loss of privilege with oppression. What we want ideally in the country is for every person to be able to make a choice about their religious uh, community and participation or not. And that each person is free to do that. And that we want every one of those communities to have an expression um, that, that people can attend and be, become part of. And so some Christians are confusing, again, uh, oppression with just a loss of privilege or, or power or hegemony or whatever you want to you want to say. But there is also a tension in the country um, based on some anti-religious bigotry in Western culture itself from the writings of John Locke and many other people, you know, kind of saying that religion is, is anti-rational, there's no thoughtfulness about it, it's all full of passions, all this kind of nonsense and that it only belongs in personal space. And so there is a, a sense in which we're trying to negotiate as a country the role that religion plays, the freedom of religious groups, and uh, the, 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 the way that religious groups can bring the ethic that they have been taught in their tradition to the public conversation. And I think that we've got a long ways to go on this. So there is some sense of people feeling like they're being pushed out and are being made vulnerable in this moment. But I, I think I want to say to my Christian friends, uh, especially, that, that we need to recognize um, that, 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 that in America, Christianity has been the dominant religion. And that just the fact that it's, we're becoming more diverse is not an attack on us. It's actually an invitation to us to go deeper into our tradition and then to engage with our neighbors and understand each other and then to work for the common good together. Could I jump in just really briefly? So just, I just also want to point out that um, even though, so th a couple things. The first is that Christianity will likely remain dominant for a really long time. Um, you know, Jews actually make up about mm, maybe 2% of the people in this country. Muslims, similarly, maybe 2 to 3%. Not, not a huge number of people. Um, so that's the first thing. Whereas Christians are, are you know, form you know if you push if you smush all the nominations together which perhaps isn't fair it, there's a there's a lot more christians um but the second thing i would say is just i, I do want to recognize that there is a certain sense of loss yeah. that i think is real and i think that should be acknowledged um and and part of it has to do with cultural pieces not not necessarily religious pieces um you know we've all we've talked before about the rural urban divide and sort of class divides between the poor and the well-off. Um, and particularly, I think that comes up in terms of sort of the religion is superstition thing. I, I know in, even in the Jewish community, that's a live issue too, right? Where you have very secular Jews who are sort of like, 
it's about religious, you know, about religious Jews. Oh, obviously religious Jews are, you know, you know, particularly when they're talking about the Orthodox community, right? Which does in fact skew more conservative um, in culturally and also politically. But, you know, these are not necessarily either fair descriptions of people who belong to these groups, even if we're talking about conservative Christians or conservative Jews or, or conservative Muslims who also exist, um, right? And, and it also is a real and genuine loss when their culture is being attacked, right? The assimilation that happens um, really is a genuine loss. And I think it's, it, it, it would, you know, like there's, a, there's sort of this um, meme that runs around that says, oh, it's not pie, we can all have rights, right? And that's true, but it's also not true. It's genuinely true that when you give up, when you get equality, you are actually giving something up. And I think that we have to really acknowledge that that loss is real. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to point out, you know, you, you gave the numbers, we know sort of the statistics of, of who's in our country, the numbers for Muslims and Jews is, are very small. Uh, Christians are, are the dominant majority. Uh, and even, even being a dominant majority, you know, the, when there have been Christian groups or individuals who have wanted to enforce Christian law beyond sort of what it exists in, in our current legal system, uh, our constitution has been strong enough to say no. You know, we're not going to have the Ten Commandments put up at this public uh, location, for instance. We're not going to have that. There have been very clear efforts uh, and very strong and appropriate uh, in, in terms of upholding religious freedom by our current structure, by our U.S. Constitution that upholds religious freedom, both through the sort of the uh, uh, anti-establishment clause, not establishing any religion, and then also upholding the ability of each person to practice their own faith. So we've been tested in that way by groups that are far more dominant than Muslims or Jews. Jews, and yet they've been ineffective. I highly doubt that Muslims or Jews can uh, ever try to sort of uh, engage in that kind of battle and win. They just, that's just not realistic. But again, it is a fear-mongering tactic that these groups that are one to two percent of our population are presented as this big threat of trying to do something that is actually directly contrary to reality. So that's number one. The other point that I, the other point I wanted to make is specifically on what Terry was saying, this idea of religious freedom, there's actually um, uh, an effort right now, uh, given the bias against religion in general that we're seeing growing in our country, there is an effort between specifically Muslims and uh, evangelical Christians uh, to build unity on religious freedom. And the reason for that is, if you remember from the chart that I showed, Muslims and evangelical Christians are some of the highest who sort of practice or believe that their religion is important in their daily life. Um, and there is a sort of a general... Uh, connection or natural connection between the two wanting to make sure they preserve their right to practice their faith. So that is actually a potential point of unity that is starting to grow in our country. Uh, and I believe next week we might even have a guest speaker that can speak about that when we address Islam and other faith traditions. So um, that, that is something promising and hopeful, uh, but it is really part of what we talk about too, which is building bridges, finding ways that we can connect with each other. And again, for all of us of any faith background or no faith background, one thing that should absolutely unite us is the sort of principle of religious freedom that exists in our country, that is upheld by our U.S. Constitution, that we should all fight for and not allow efforts to strip any of us of religious freedom uh, to prevail in any kind of way. Well, and I, I just want to, I, I, so I so appreciate what both of you have said, and I, I just want to add to that too, to my, you know, to my own statement, that, um, that number one, the, the grief that, that some Christians are experiencing at, the, at a more complex world, at least, um, I mean, it's, it is real. But I, I want to remind us that that we share, you know, with with our Jewish neighbors, you know, the Hebrew passage in Ecclesiastes that about, um, you know, it is not wise to say that the former years were better than these, and we have to we have to actually face our grief like squarely and not fall into nostalgia, which always wants to push us into the past and lift up the past in some idealized way. Secondly, I just want to say that it's really important for Christians to go directly to Jesus here. And ask, and ask the question, like in the Gospels, how does Jesus respond to people of different, of different uh, cultures and of different religious identities? What does he do? And what was commonly done 
Uh, and Jesus was willing to engage and to speak well of Samaritans with whom Jews at the time and, and Samaritans had a tremendous amount of difficulty and disagreement with each other and, and even disdain for each other. But Jesus was willing to acknowledge that their theology could produce people capable of loving their neighbor. And that's just one example. And so I want to encourage Christians uh, to go deeper into your tr our tradition in order to answer the question about how we respond to people of other traditions. In Acts 10, it says, you know, for, for truly God shows no partiality, that, that every nation where people, you know, are loving their neighbor and doing what is right are honored by God. Some of those passages, like because of white Christian supremacy, we have under-remembered. Uh, we, we've, we've sold them short. And, uh, and remember, of course, in, in Matthew 25, you know, the, the measure uh, when the judgment comes isn't whether or not you got your theology right or whether you went to the right church. It's whether or not you were kind to the vulnerable and that you gave, you know, water to the thirsty and so on. And so um, I, I think what I want to say to Christians is go deeper into your, our tradition in order to be able to find how to deal with this situation. Yep. Thank you for that. And on that note, I think we're going to go ahead and, and close today's session. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about Islam and other religions. So that'll give us an opportunity to delve even deeper into some of exactly what we started talking about today as well. So we'll really talk about what Islam teaches about how to interact with other traditions. And you'll hear a little of what Terry just said with Christianity also reflected in Islam and what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught and enforced and implemented himself in his life. So please join Join us next week at 4 p.m. Uh, but for this week, at least, we really want to thank Rabbi Alana for joining us for this, especially in the, you know, right, coming right out of her, the, the Holy Day celebration and joining us uh, and being three hours ahead there on the East Coast as well. So we do appreciate your time and, and the uh, additional content that you brought and the wisdom that you shared with us today. Uh, and, and Terry, as always, very grateful for you and your contributions as well. And we are so thankful to all of you who joined us for today's session. Session. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are going to include a bonus session, a bonus webinar session that's going to be specifically on the messaging point. Because again, it's one thing for you to know this information or to sort of remove sort of the bias, biases uh, or misconceptions from, from yourself, but it's quite another to be able to respond to all of the misconceptions that we're constantly being faced with when it comes to Islam and Muslims. And that's why we kind of want to give you a sort of how to guideline uh, in terms of responding to the myths and misconceptions, even as you are learning about these myths and misconceptions yourself. If you have any questions or feedback that you want to share privately, uh, please feel free to do so. There is a contact us feature on our website at factsoverfear.org. Uh, so please do use that and follow up with us. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much, everybody. Shalom. Always Shalom. a pleasure. Good night. <laughs>